I had the great good fortune, as many of you know, to have grown up at Ananda Village. As I like to quote from a children's book, I say I was born and bred in the briar patch. And that came with it a host of blessings and a few hurdles which I had to overcome to be able to authentically find my own two feet firmly on this path. But one of the extraordinary blessings that I was given was exposure to Swamiji's music from at the age of birth. And actually, as a matter of fact, I'm very touched because the chant that my father would often sing to us to put us to sleep at night was none other than the last chant that we did together, Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, Om. And often my parents would chant to us to put us to sleep at night, but I loved the music so that I would stay up. I would try and stay awake so I could hear. And then after they left, I would fall asleep. And as some of you know, David Eby was my cello teacher. He's a great musician and dove very deeply into tuning into Swamiji's music. And he actually lived next door to us for a number of years in my childhood. And occasionally he and his wife would come over for dinner and things like that. And I would come to that appointed hour when the little ones, myself included, had to go to sleep. And occasionally David would have his cello and he would offer to play for us. And he would play some of Swamiji's melodies. And I remember very distinctly one night he played for us and he was playing melodies like life is a quest for joy or love is the dream of infinity, these incredible, these sweet melodies. And I was sitting in my bunk bed listening. And then I heard him leave and I heard him walk into the kitchen and my parents asked, did they fall asleep? And David said, oh yeah, they fell asleep. <laughs> Fooled you. I was awake the whole time. Now there are probably other times that I've fallen asleep. I'm notorious for being lights out in an instant, so I'm sure there are instances that I'm unaware of. But this is all, uh, now you may ask, how is this on topic for today? The intuition is simple, the intellect is complex. Well, it's very interesting, was many of my most powerful, profound experiences of the presence of God, which is to say intuition, because Master defined intuition as being the soul's power to know God, which is to say that we're not going to debate whether or not it exists or whether he has a white beard or three legs or 17 arms and what weapons he holds in each of them, but rather it's your direct inner experience. And often I would have direct inner experiences through the music because what music does is give you, it interiorizes the energy of the heart, awakens it and uplifts it and interestingly enough, Yogananda said intuition is centered at the middle resting point between the heart and the spiritual eye. And so if we can awaken the devotion and the energy of the heart and uplift it, what we begin to feel is the intuitive perception of the presence of God. And this is why chanting is half the battle. This is why music is so emphasized on this path, because Lest ye see signs and miracles, ye shall not believe. And as Asha pointed out, that's not a compliment. But through awakening devotion and through uplifting the heart's energy, we can see those signs and miracles. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So at any rate, there I was, a young child growing up at Ananda Village. And uh, as it turned out, by no real talent of my own, it turned out that I had a nice boy soprano voice and I had at least an acceptable ability to hold pitch. And so what that meant was my mother drug me by the ear to choir rehearsal every Tuesday night. And every Tuesday night, I kid you not, and I say this one part as an, uh, an encouragement to every parent and every teacher in the room, I resisted it like it was the plague every single week. Mom, don't make me go. No, please, I hate choir. I hate going to choir. Everyone's so old and I'm so young. I don't like singing this. You can't make me do it. I'm, I haven't finished eating my dinner. I have homework. No, you're going. And she was adamantine about this and she would drag me every single week. And I just felt it was so unfair and she was so mean. And then guess what would happen? Yeah, you know where this is going. I'd sing the music, and at the end, I'd say, wow, I had such a great time. I loved singing that song. Wasn't that so beautiful? And so she would take me back every week, even though I resisted it and drug my feet. 
But what was very interesting was as a young boy of six or seven years old, it's hard to grasp intellectually some of the concepts that Swamiji is talking about in some of these songs. For example, there's joy in the heavens. He says, men hunger for freedom, but don't see their dungeon is only the thought that they're bound. Desires are their shackles. The hope that tomorrow the doorway to joy will be found. I sang that song hundreds of times for decades. And only about five years ago, I went, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. That's pretty profound statement right there. It's just sort of, you know, there's a, a few parentheses and commas that make you kind of have to fish around for the line of logic, but it's a pretty incredible statement to make. If you really were to absorb that, that single thought would revolutionize your life. So anyway, there I am, a child, six years old. I'm singing songs of Swamiji that are, have lyrics like that or lyrics describing the guru's love. And I'm, yeah, it sounds pretty good to me, but I don't have the direct experience. Now, someone with a more developed intellect, a more developed brain, might have, you know, if you put a microphone in front of their mouth, been able to reinterpret the poetry and give you an interpretation of what it meant in more common parlance. But I had no idea really what we were saying. But here's what was very interesting. Occasionally, I would have these moments when the music would penetrate through the veil of my consciousness and I would have a direct experience. And even then, even though I lacked the words, I understood. One of the most powerful moments that happened to me was singing a song from Swami Kriyananda's oratorio. I'm 11 years old. And the song is Living Water, and the lyric is, He can redeem you from every evil. Friend, only think of him. Walk by his side. And we were rehearsing this over and over in choir. We probably sang that one section 10 or 15, 20 times. David Eby was really drilling us. And there's a temptation to sort of check out because I was also, like I said, a classically trained cellist. So I knew how the notes went. I knew what he was asking of me. So I could sort of sing on autopilot. And that's what I often did in those music rehearsals. But for some reason that night, God was good. And God blessed me with concentration. And with that concentration, I pierced through. And with the help of that melody, I didn't intellectually understand. Because what, what, what could an 11-year-old possibly know about redemption or the spiritual meaning behind that? But suddenly, what I felt was Christ's consciousness. What I felt was his power, his grace his promise, his kindness, that he can redeem you from every evil. That's an overwhelming thing to consider. It completely bursts the boundary of every single experience that we can have in this material world. There is no love like that. Greater can no love be than this, as it says in the Festival of Light. And there I was, 11 years old, and suddenly I felt it. It wasn't an intellectual understanding, a well-rehearsed definition. It was a direct, intuitive experience. And I had to sit down, tears flowing down my face, because I had met Christ. And then the next day, I walk into school, with my peers who were trying on the oh-so-attractive garment of spiritual skepticism. And they mock, oh, the spiritual eye, as if that's real. Oh, Jesus this or Jesus that. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, it's real. It's real. I've seen it. Just like St. Anthony of the Desert, though, of course, lesser in magnitude, though not different in spirit. St. Anthony of the Desert was able to quell an entire heresy with four words, I have seen him. With such deep intuitive conviction that everyone present was able to understand that what he spoke was true. True in the deepest sense. True in the sense that all of us too can perceive that. Now flash forward. 
The intellect is complex. Intuition is simple. There I am, I'm a musician, I'm a cellist, I'm learning, I'm developing my skills. I'm starting to learn more and more complex pieces on the cello that have 16th notes, which is a fancy way of saying that it's fast. That they have grace notes, which is a fancy way of saying they do little trills and interesting things. And then what happens but at a spiritual renewal week, David puts together an orchestra, a ramshackle orchestra, of all of us young uns, and we're going to try and play Swamiji's piece, Life is a Quest for Joy, which is a 23-minute suite composed for violin and cello as a singing duet, almost as if between the devotee's heart and God, supported by a string ensemble. And so he puts this orchestra together, composed mostly of myself and my fellow cronies of little guys, and he and one of our friends from Nevada City, who is a professional violinist, played the two lead voices. Now, let me give you some context. My part sounded roughly like this. Bum, 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 bum. That's not very inspiring. Let's just call it as it is. It's also not very intellectually interesting, is it? Especially compared to all the intricacies which I was learning on my own. So then David brings me into these rehearsals and same thing, my mother drags me by the ear, mom, it's so boring, I don't wanna go. And there I am, I'm sitting in rehearsal and for two hours I have to sit there struggling through this 23 minute piece. And then not only that, but David's telling me, Keshava, you're a little flat, you're a little sharp here, you gotta work on your intonation. And I'm thinking, I don't even care. Why am I playing this piece? Flash forward, two weeks later, we're performing Spiritual Renewal Week. It's the night, Swamiji's in the audience. I had never heard the piece played front to back in its entirety, nonstop with both of the solo instruments, the violin and the cello. I sit down, the lights are there, it's dark. We start playing and suddenly out of the ensemble of strings, there swells that majestic melody from the cello Life is a quest for joy. And then echoing in response as if the divine calling back, we hear the violin. And I lose myself in the experience of the music and tears again running down my face. I could feel this joy, this bliss, this understanding. This is what life is. I was 12 years old. And I remember thinking, I told David afterwards, I said, anytime you want me to play that part, I'll play it. <laughs> Beautifully enough, actually flash forward to the 50th anniversary in 2019, I got opportunity to do just that. David asked me to come play. Now by this point, I think I probably possess the skills necessary to play the lead part, but he asked me to play one of the supporting parts. And I played it with all my sincerity and devotion but in rehearsal, in that temple, when we began to play that piece of music, I was overwhelmed. And even could feel, I, I told David later, I said, I think one of the reasons I took incarnation in this body was to play that piece of music. Is that true? Who knows? But that's what I felt. So deep was how it touched me. But now here's the interesting thing. Like I said, let's rewind the clock a little bit. So there I am, I'm a teenager, I'm learning music. I'm learning concertos now, which are like really flashy show-off ways to show the virtuoso capacity of a player. I'm competing. I'm competing against musicians in the local area, which actually was quite stiff competition. Nevada City fosters some excellent musical talent. But then we were, me, my friends and I were clean sweeping the area. Like it was, it was um, we always knew it was either myself or one of my other friends who would win every single year. And it was just sort of a coin toss to see which, a three-headed coin toss to see which one it was. But so was kind of wanting to stretch our wings a little bit, David encouraged me to enter a West Coast concerto competition. Now, now you're fighting in the big leagues now. I mean, that's heavyweight. And so, now, instead of playing against some kids who have been playing for a few years, I'm playing against the kids who've been playing since they're three, since they're four, who have no lives, whose parents have no other purpose than to torture their children. <laughs> and that's who I'm up against. And I think, that would be great. I love this concerto. This concerto is so joyful. I love joy. Let's go play. And the definition, the, the parameter of the competition was we were supposed to submit 
two movements of the concerto, which is about 30 or 40 minutes of music. So I recorded my two movements, I submitted it, I was accepted, I got to the final round of competition where we actually went to a university and 10 of us, the top 10 and the entire West Coast, got to go head to head in a musical battle royale to see who was the best. I'll, let me just give you a cut to the chase, it was not me. But so there we are, I'm 16, I've been playing the cello for 11 years. I've had these incredible experiences of divine contact through music. That when I sit down to play music, I'm not trying to just play perfectly, I'm trying to play with joy. And the reason I chose the concerto I chose was because it felt like jubilance. And I thought that sounds like a pretty good thing to try and share. So I get into the competition and when it comes down to it, they tell everyone, because there's 10 competitors, they say you can only play a 15 minute cut of your concerto. And I'm like, only? 15 minutes, that's a long chunk. So I was really happy. I played the first movement of my concerto, it was 12 minutes long, bingo, under 15. I was the only person under 15. Every single person went over. One of the guys played, I think for about 35 minutes with no intention of stopping. And the judges had to stand up and tell him, okay, stop, stop, stop. And when he finally stopped, he turned with this smug look to turn to his teacher like, look how far I got. <laughs> he ended up winning, actually. But you know what was interesting? I hated his music. <laughs> because it was nothing but noise. It was chaos. It was intellectual beyond imagination. It was so complex, you couldn't even fathom what was trying to happen, Let, what to speak of enjoy it. It was nothing but noise, as Shakespeare said, sound and fury signifying nothing. I will say there was one competitor there who played elegantly, who played with beauty, and I found him to be very moving. But every single other competitor played with nothing but their minds. It was an exercise to see who could be the most pedantic in execution, who had the fastest fingers and the sharpest ears. It was really a competition to see who, who could endure the most hours of practice. That's really what we were trying to ascertain. And so out of 10, they named the top three. I was probably number 10. Um, but what was very interesting was I sat there listening to them play and I realized it was self-evident I'm not winning this competition. And then I also realized something else. If this is what it takes to be a professional performing soloist, I don't want it. It's not for me. Because that's not what music is. That's not what moves me. I don't want to have to play like that to be able to play in front of people. And so just then and there, I knew there was no desire for me to be a soloist. And some of the people who I played music with were sort of aghast at that. But to me, they were missing what music was, which is a feeling, which is the intuition, which brings me back to what I really was hoping to talk mostly about today, which is the power of Swamiji's music. Because that music, if you play it to a trained professional classical musician, almost unanimously, their first comment is, um, it's a bit simple. Yes, it is a bit simple, but so is intuition. It's not complex because every note tells a story, because every note is perfectly in tune with the vibration that Swamiji was hoping to express. There's no need for frills or trills or anything at all, just the vibration that's flowing through it. And how powerful is that vibration? Well, I invite you to sing it and find out for yourselves. There was a house concert here yesterday, which I'm sad to have missed, but it was just an opportunity for people who aren't the big guns of singing, so to speak, or just everyone to just get a chance to come sing and sing Swami's songs and to enjoy it and to sing in this temple. And I watched just a few clips of it this morning because it was already posted and there was so much joy coming from that experience that I could feel vicariously through a recording. That's what Swamiji's music can give to us can give us a direct experience of that joy. There is joy in the heavens. And if you'd like to find out, sing that song. And sing that song with an open heart and allow it to uplift you, to move you, to transform you. And you know, it might just catch you by surprise. It might just catch you completely left on your left foot when you're not ready for it. 
When I once, I was, um, I was in high school and I went and sang Swami's Oratorio at a college and Ramesha, who is a great singer and helps lead the music ministry at Ananda Village, he was my vocal teacher and sort of the head of the tenor section. And he stood right in front of me and during that concert. And I, for almost the entire concert, uh, children are absolutely unbearable. I blew on the back of his head <laughs> like this. Just a little bit, because he had this little cowlick in the back of his head. So I would blow just a little bit to make the hairs dance. And then right when he would, he would do this. And I'd wait. And I'd do it again. And then finally he goes. And he starts like, he starts looking for the air duct. Like, what am I standing underneath that keeps doing it? And every time he'd turn around, I'd show my poker face, you know. Or, you know, the pious poker face. <laughs> but so I got him the entire time. That was like, that was what I was really concentrating on. The whole concert was like, how irritating can I be to my vocal teacher without him knowing that it's me? Ah, uh, the mind of a 14-year-old Keshava. It's not so different from a now Keshava, to be honest. But anyway, I won't be too self-revealing there. So there I was. And we come to the final song, Thy Light Within Us Shining, which we're going to sing together in about 15 minutes. And... We sing that song, thy light within us shining has shown where freedom lies. From earthly walls confining to soar in spirit's skies. How oft like sheep we've strayed apart, now guided by thy ray. In inner freedom of the heart, our night has turned to day. And suddenly I sing that song after having sung it every single Sunday for my entire life, but I finally receive it. I felt so much joy, so much expansion of consciousness. It was my first, I would put it in quotes, nearly out of body experience. I felt so much bliss after the conclusion of that song I couldn't, I had, I just sat down and I wept in silent reverie for 25 minutes. Like the bus was ready to leave and Keshava was still on the pew crying. They had to come get me. But, so it can catch you completely off guard. And you don't have to be a great singer. You don't have to be super concentrated or super yogi to be able to tap into the power of that music. 10 seconds before that experience, I was blowing on the back of Ramesh's head. And it's not complex. Swamiji's music, in contrast to those concertos I heard, from a technical perspective, a musician would say, child's play. I can sight sing that. I can sight read that. I could hear it once and notate it back to you perfectly. No problem. And yet, which of those pieces had the power to change my life? And which of these music had the opportunity to transform me and to teach me who I really am? time and time again. And so here's my invitation to all of us. Intuition is simple. The intellect is complex. If you want to discover your intuition, listen to Swami's music and feel. What does it say to you? What is that melody awakening within your heart? What is the rightness that you feel as you listen to that melody? How does it transform you? And then learn to flow with this music. Allow it to teach you how to live. Teach you how to respond to life. Whether it be raining and windy or in the tempest seize the lightning flash and ride the winds of change. However it may be. But I invite all of you. This music is not for the few. It's for the many. It's for all of us. It is one of the most approachable tools. And it doesn't matter if you sing well or if you sound like a squawking dodo bird. Just try. Sing. Sing, as Swamiji says, and the battle is won. God bless you, friends. Have a wonderful week.
replies or not keep calling him in the temple of unceasing prayer believe that he's approaching there and call speak not nor ask when to expect from you an answer you know my heart I'll call to thee again keep calling him keep calling him Stop love.